Hopefully you have Hello and welcome to the Writing Community Chat Show. Chris, it's gone, so that's why we're having technical problems because it keeps going off and off and off. <laughs> but we'll get, we'll get there. So, you may notice that I have a special guest with me today. This is not Chris Haggart. This is Connor. Nope. Much better looking version. Yep. <laughs> Hi, how are you doing? Thanks for having me on. I'm really excited. It's going to be great. No, we're so excited to have uh, you on, Connor. So we saw your little clip. Um, that was absolutely fantastic. I love the mouth harmonica. Um, it just, it, I was laughing loads. So that's why we got you on the show, because we thought you'd be comedy gold. And he's gone. This is a great start, by the way. So Connor is frozen, but we can see his lovely face just there. Oh. And... He keeps saying, oh, I'm coming back in, but he'll be back in in a second. But today's beer sponsor for the show is going to come across well, the screen. I can't see Chris Uli, um, so I don't know if that means no one can see um, And Connor's coming in. <laughs> um, so I'm not sure what we do, but it's we're live. Very exciting. <laughs> uh, let's see. So we'll carry on. Connor does keep popping in and out. Um, so it's Leyland uh, uh and her book is Becoming Insane, and it's been given 4.3 stars out of 5 online. And this is a psychological thriller, and it is an example of how a skilled writer and a storyteller should write a novel. That's a review that she's received, so clearly high praise for that book. So up in this... Ooh, there, we should see that book very shortly. Wave the magic finger and it should appear. Ooh. Hey, it worked. Becoming insane is there. I think I'm becoming insane because Connor is popping in and out, but he's about to come back, I think. Anyway, today's show is very exciting. The guest that we've got on is an absolutely fabulous author, and he's an okay, okay um podcast host um he's, he's all right he's not bad but he's a brilliant author and he's written two books deep the climb of truth and deep the embers of life which i read today and it was absolutely fantastic so without further ado let's get him on the show it's mr chris agate hello oh he's there <laughs> um uh... I'm so glad to be on the show and it's great to be introduced as a guest and it's fantastic to see Connor's face freezing and disappearing from the show constantly. <laughs> um, so brilliant. How's it going? Yeah, not bad. Uh, I mean, <laughs> I, I did say I didn't want to do a solo interview again, but it looks like I've got no choice, to be honest, uh, because Connor's having an absolute nightmare. Um, but I'm sure he'll come eventually. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Yeah, we'll just carry on. If he comes in, he comes in. If he, if he doesn't, <laughs> then it does me and you. So tell us about Deep the Embers of Life, Mr. Agat. What is it about? And yeah, where can we find it? Well, uh, Deep the Embers of Life. Connor's just rejoined the stream, guys. And if you are watching, please interact with us. Uh, is he back? Hey! 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 <laughs> Hi, Connor. <laughs> That wasn't stressful at all for me because <laughs> <laughs> all I could see, my laptop just decided to stop working. And I, from my perspective, there was a banner going across the bottom. Chris Hooley was gone. And I was there going, oh, no, I don't know if I'm live. So hi, everybody. Uh, this is going to be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> no worries, mate. No worries. Good to have you on board. And th uh, well done for winning the competition. And it's great to see you hosting. And, you know, you've been on the show with us before. It's fantastic. So glad to see you on, on board. Loving the mic, by the way. Yeah. Pardon? Loving the mic as well. Really nice setup you've got there. I'm really annoyed. Now I, now I'm use, I have to use my phone mic, although my phone camera is better, so it kind of works out. Mm. This is my very fancy microphone. Like it. And a great shirt as well. Dressed up for the yeah, occasions. I, got... I did. It's actually brand new, so there we go. Oh. I wore it especially for uh, the, the big day, Chris. And congratulations. That I, 
to for Agate, uh, specifically for the book. Um, is great. How do you feel? Um, really excited. And do you know what? It's very strange that when I released my first book, it was only uh, last year. Uh, I was so nervous and uptight about the whole process. I don't think I actually enjoyed it at all. And this is something we <laughs> pointed out on the show that you need to stop and appreciate the little things. Uh, and, you know, writing a book takes a long time and all the processes take a long time. But, you know, now this is my second book. I really feel like I can get into it and I can enjoy the experience and I feel like I've improved on it. And, um, you know, it's just a wonderful, wonderful experience now that, you know, is uh, exaggerated compared to last time. So I'm very, very happy. And, you know, having the podcast now as well and just the the community that's around it is really supportive. So it just feels brilliant, to be honest with you at the moment. So we'll see how it goes. Fantastic. So you were about to tell us about this book then, Deep the Embers of Life. It's out today. People can get it. Mm -hmm. But why should they buy it? What's it about? Well, of course, uh, Deep is a series and this is the second book in that series. So if you haven't read the first one, um, a lot of people do say you don't have to read the first one. But I, I would suggest that you should in this book because it's about uh, a young lady called Daisy and her journey. Uh, it's not a very easy journey for her. It's very troublesome and, you know, violent and up and downs. And she kind of feels like she wants to chase love and affection and just be, you know, felt, feel like she's involved. <laughs> and you know what I mean? She she wants to be belong to something. And it just is constantly pulled away from her. In the first, the first book, um, she goes through a very, I guess, traumatic sort of time and deals with a lot of things that she doesn't understand and she's getting used to and the second book kind of continues where she finds her feet and her character in a character arc really goes from a young lady discovering things to a young woman discovering things but also becoming herself and really finding that courage and strength within her so I think it's a real good uh, progression of her character and the story that she she follows nice so we'll just give a special shout out to all the people that are interacting so animosi cat woohoo hello uh halo scott wished you congratulations as well which is brilliant and happy release day thank nice you nice halo and then we have mario who we just had on the show is brilliant as well so he says congrats as well nice thanks guys that thanks for good. interacting keep them coming now, while people are interacting, I'm going to give them a little extra incentive to keep them interacting. <laughs> <laughs> and this is this has been my devious plan of dozing off as well. There, so it's very very simple. If you want to see Mr. Hooley or Mr. Agate or myself, uh, have to obey a ridiculous rule like any time we take a sip of a drink, our pinky fingers have to be extended, or anything along those lines. Any silly mad silly rules. Uh, it's really simple. Screenshot or um, proof that you have bought Chris's book and then tweet it to us and we'll see it and then we'll obey the rule that you guys give us. Now, in coming up with this rule, my intention originally was to hold my phone up to my laptop camera and be like, look, I'm buying it right now. Here's how easy it is, but I can't do that. So I will buy it as soon as this is uh, as <laughs> soon as <this> <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, Chris, the demand for the steamy stuff seems to be quite high. So I, I've read Deep the Embers of Life, and you've mentioned that it has a scene in particular that you would classify as steamy. Mm -hmm. um, so how did you find writing that scene? Like, I know you're quite a visual writer, and you tend to see these <laughs> play out in your head before <laughs> you put them down on paper. Was that the case with this scene? And can you tell us how that writing process was for you? Absolutely. Um, I am a visual writer, so indeed I did see these scenes play out in my head. And of course, that is clearly <laughs> because um, I'm very imaginative and it's all about the storytelling. I do have my jelly tots with me um, because I am a panzer or panther, as we know with Anna. Um, you know, I really sort of go through the process and sort of see the stories play out in this in my mind as well so i didn't see this you know appearing in the book but i knew what the character you know i knew what daisy wants <laughs> and she is someone who is discovering herself so doesn't really know what she wants and like i said she's gone through a really hard time and and there are things that kind of 
come into her life w w without her sort of wanting it or, you know. So that scene was initially something that I thought, okay, I, this is happening in the scene, but how do I write this without... Because sex scenes in a book are often classed as either completely sort of over the top or maybe not enough or some of the words that are used really sort of off-putting. So I wanted to be really careful with the way I wrote this scene. Can you give um, us an example of an off-putting word? Um, <laughs> there are some off-putting words. Uh, do, you, do you really want me to say these now? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, yep. I don't know, actually. It's sad. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I can't. I can't think of any right now. Um, <laughs> Surely you can uh, give them some... Uh... Jogger's memory a little bit of some of the words. No, not not in my book. My book was done very, I think, in the right kind of way is what I was getting at. Mm. Ah. But there are. Oh, there you go. We've got one on the screen. Moist. And and actually, this is a word that I really like. So <laughs> I, I don't think that's a bad word, Halo. And I'm, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> I just let these comments coming in. They're fantastic. Um, so. Yeah. So obviously right in the scene, um, you're talking about that and you're talking about the process involved and you obviously did a lot of research in writing this scene <laughs> <laughs> yeah go on um, um, so I was just wondering what type of research you may have done and how you got that to come across did you rewrite this scene multiple times or no I didn't have to go with this scene multiple times Chris basically um, I kind of put myself in the character in the moment um, and you know, uh, you mentioned before we came on screen actually about the music, and there's quite a lot of music that influence is in this book. Mm. And actually, I've spoken about on the show before. I've got my own playlist on Spotify that I write with every single time. And now, if I've shared this playlist, so if someone starts listening to this quite often and um, get to know the songs that repeat on there, they will recognize some of these songs. So it wasn't just a case of okay, they're in this apartment and this is going on and this is going to happen. It was actually. I can see the apartment. I can see what's going on, where they are. So it was just um, the build up of the story and how that developed, and mm. and you know, it's just kind of how it played out. So you talk about playlists. Were you ever tempted to put that song in there? That let me go deep, 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 deep. Uh, I've never heard of that song, Chris. You've never heard that song? No. Neither have I. <laughs> <laughs> Has oh, anyone on uh, Twitter or on the messages ever seen this? Uh, because I haven't got a clue. You wrote, a book called, you wrote a book called Deep and you don't know that song. No, I can't I can't say I've known that song. That's that's like the main lyric to that song. And it's a sex <laughs> song as well. <laughs> anyone heard? No, Halo's no. No, no oh. one said the song, Chris. Right, Chris, we need to rectify this. We can play it now because we're live. We can do that. Yep. That's so let, let's... Works. Let, yeah, let's go onto Google and just find this song and see okay. if it's relevant okay. to you the scene talk, that you were writing about. Talk among yourselves and I'll find it. What's it called? Deep. Deep. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I should have gone for the old uh, deep rap song. It's not that, is it? No. Rolling in the deep? No. No. Who is it by? Uh, just, just type in the lyrics. Just type in, let me go deep, 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 deep. I don't want to Honestly. text him to Google. <laughs> <laughs> this is not the way I thought this podcast would go. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Okay, I found it. Oh, okay. Um, let me see if I can uh, play this to you guys. I wasn't uh, making it up. We'll have to wait for an advert slightly. Okay, we can wait for an advert. So, right. Connor, how did you imagine this show to go? Considering you didn't imagine this, haven't you? Okay, I've got it. I've got it. <laughs> you to go this way, just not this quickly. <laughs> Black Street is the band. <laughs> we can't hear the music, mate. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, I was dancing away there. Right, hang on. That That is brilliant as well, by the way. Um, it is. It was the first thing. It was very seedy. Okay, let me get this. Shit audio. There you go. Ready?
<laughs> oh, do you know what? That was the perfect soundtrack to that scene. That's definitely going in your playlist, then. That's, that's uh, it. <laughs> how deep is your love? Oh, yeah, oh, okay, that would have been okay. it. Um, just my wife uh, read that scene as a woman that I know, and she wasn't, say, you know, quite, all right, it's all right. It wasn't like a bad thing or a good thing, and I take that, that's a good sign. Is someone moving uh, somewhere? That's my girlfriend getting the chocolate tin down from the top of the cupboard. Have you hidden that Chris? Yeah, I put them up there purposefully, and she's got a brush to get them down. <laughs> <laughs> that's very cruel. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, Chris, I have a question for you. Uh, Absolutely. Between the two books, right, mm -hmm. do you find it easier or harder writing the second one? Because I did try to start writing a sequel to my novel and failed miserably and actually ended up getting rid of the manuscript because okay. I just couldn't. How, how, did you, how did you find it? Uh, do you know what? I... The first book I wrote, The Deep, first in the first in the series, The Climb of Truth, was something I did because it was off the back of uh, my grandfather passing last year. And it, I reflected, you know, on his funeral, a lot of people spoke about his life and it was very sort of uplifting in that sense. And I thought, you know what, I really kind of want to do something a bit more or a bit different. And this is where the writing came from. So it was a kind of a new experience for me. And I didn't realize that I wanted to do writing as much. Uh, you know, it's kind of just something that happened. But when then I was, you know, sort of stuck in the process, I really fell in love with writing that a lot of people probably understand. Uh, so when I'd finished the first book and it was all sort of wrapped up in the whole, uh, I guess, um, release, you know, sort of thing. And then dealing with the old marketing and just being, like I said before, so wrapped up in what was going on, didn't really enjoy that process so much because I was so nervous about it all. So when it came to writing the second book, I was itching. You know, I was thinking, okay, you know, I, and I kind of feel like I've got a feel on what I'm supposed to be doing now. I feel like my writing improved mass massively uh, from learning as best I could. And then it kind of got to a point where I was, again, writing the story. And I was thinking, do you know what? I, I just don't think this is good. Um, and I had that real doubt moment a few times. And then going back editing, I was like, actually, what I thought wasn't a good point in that story, I actually really like. And the feedback I was getting off people was you know, you've improved um, this, I really like this part of the story. And often that wasn't the part of the story that I thought people would really like. So, you know, it's kind of strange that what people's perceptions of the parts of the stories they like. So, I, I don't know. I, I did find it an easier, uh, more, uh, I was more willing to go for it because I kind of thought I knew what I was doing compared to the first time. If that makes yeah. sense. No, no, it does, mm. it does. It does. Mm. Um, what was the most then surprising aspect of writing the sequel? Like y you went in a, little, a lot more confident because you had already done it. But was there anything that when you went into writing the second book that you were shocked at? Like, did you get stuck at something uh, at some point that you previously mm. were able to? Write yeah, through? massively uh, the ending. And this was because the first book kind of leaves, uh, I guess this is a sequel, so I can say a bit of a cliffhanger on the first first uh, book and this one I kind of had to tie up the story without kind of there's a few factors at play there and I you know I don't want to go into it too much but I had to kind of tie it up and that was yeah uh, that was kind of a hard really hard thing to do without kind of spoiling the story because you don't want to end something that's maybe maybe ended maybe not ended on a bad way you've really got to make sure that's kind of like you know actually I appreciate where that went and whether it's what you agree with or not, you know, it's not something that you were disappointed with. So that's really careful what you do because that could influence the next book. Um, so with the first book, I knew, I knew it was left on the hanger and I knew I could take the story forward with this part of the book. It was kind of like, okay, where do I leave it? How do I leave it? Where everyone's satisfied and then look at progressing and that, you know, maybe again for the next time. So mm. it, that I found that really tricky and I actually had to rewrite that scene say two or three times whereas everything else i kind of just go on autopilot and go through and then go back and edit or add to or subtract from so i found the end in the trickiest part definitely and we we've had quite a lot of like experienced 
and quite like just really good authors on the show recently. Obviously, with you writing this book, did you take any of their own advice on board and like apply it to any parts of the book? Or um, do you know what? A lot of this was done before the show. But I definitely have taken a lot of advice from the shows we've got because you know yourself, you know, we've had some really, really insightful interviews and that helps massively. Um, But what I did take and sorry, this light is weird um, and really appreciate from pretty much everyone was take your time, take Mm. your time and just work at it and make sure it's right. And um, I think that's the best, biggest advice that people have, have given so Halo Scott's got a great question. Did readers from book one inform any events in book two? Inform? Yeah, so affects how you were right. Like were you thinking about what people said? Oh, okay, about okay. Book book? Um that's 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 a tough one. And to be honest with you, I didn't get a hell of a lot of feedback in that respect, other than you know, I've had some absolutely wonderful reviews and they've all been sort of, you know, this was great, this was great, you know, like like this part. And there was never really any constructive criticism in that sense, apart from, you know, I've spoken openly before that I kind of rushed the first... I didn't rush the first book. I went down a budgeted route and I didn't get it professionally edited and that's been highlighted very slightly. You know, I've had some fantastic reviews, but... Uh, <laughs> um, but, you know, it's... um. <laughs> just throw me off track on that uh, you know uh what was i saying okay so the influence the, the the reviews i've had and the comments i've had have all been sort of you know i liked how this happened rather than i oh, kind of wish this had happened so there was never really a need to address address anything from a fan's perspective at the moment uh, but i'm sure you know this sort of story where it takes more form because in the first book things were taken from daisy a lot and they're still taken from Daisy a lot in the second book, but she's more in control of her destiny, I feel. She's she's grown into a stronger character. And uh, I think she becomes more fierce and more um, controlling of her own destiny, whereas I think in the first it was kind of taken. So hmm. I don't know. So was that always your intention to have this character arc in terms of having her grow and develop? Or was that something that when you finished book two, you were like... Um, Oh, sorry, when you finish book one, you were like, right, for book two, I need to do this, or did it just sort of come to you? No, I think I think Daisy's character, I mean, there's a lot of people that have said how much they like Daisy as a character, and I was exactly the same. When I wrote her, I kind of fell in love with my character in, in a weird way. I don't know if that's weird or whatever. But um, I knew that she was a young woman at that time, and she was progressing into a, a someone who has become, um, you know, kind of an innocent young person into someone who's been through a lot of shit and then has to like adapt and survive so it was kind of one of those things where i really felt that her character arc must have been that way Mm. you know there's only so much someone can take before they either break or there's a quote in one of the i think it might be the first book that says oh no it's in the second you would have read this from the character william uh, that comes in it says if you fight monsters long enough you may become one that sort of thing. So I think her her journey is along that line. It's very fine line between becoming a monster or, you know, just living that what that edge where you're just angry at stuff at, and not going crazy. So it's very close. And I knew where Ark had to go in that direction. Mm. So I've read this book. Obviously, I read it today, and I just want to talk about not particular scenes, but particular characters. Um, so there's one, there's two actually in particular that I want to get your opinion on or your thoughts about. Um, Jade is the first one. <laughs> now, obviously, I'm not going to go into too much information about Jade because uh, I don't yeah. want to spoil it for anyone. But for me, how is it? <laughs> yeah, how is it for you? Um, obviously, there's quite a lot of characters that, that are in book two from book one, which is great. Mm-hmm. Um, but how is it for you to create new characters and Jade in particular? I loved it. Uh, I really think that I kept the character numbers low in the first book. And I think that's vital to any new sort of author that you kind of don't go crazy and expand a world that's really big and confusing. Just try and keep it fairly simple. And I think it was a really nice group of a tight group of characters in the first book. But I thought, that, OK, this is a chance to expand that. So Jade, for example, um, I really like her character as well in just how different she is from Daisy. 
And, you know, Jade was someone who's, you know, living off her inheritance and doesn't really work for money and is just lives a free life and just kind of wild. Mm. And you've got Daisy who's brought up, you know, in a place where uh, she has no sort of choice of what she's doing and it's kind of restricted. So when they meet, it's kind of a clash of worlds. And she's able to show, you know, Daisy so much of what she hasn't seen. And I really like that. I think that's a really cool thing. And um... <laughs> uh, yeah, she's, you know, she gets shown a lot. And um, <laughs> I think, you know, she's a really controlling character, whereas Daisy hasn't been so far. And I think it's a good, really good meet of characters. Yeah, my second character that I want to probe you on is a very small character. But for me, it's significant because obviously we know, or I know in particular, that your wife's name is Sarah. Mm -hmm. And you mention a character in your book, in your second one, by the, the same name as your wife. So I wondered why you decided to do that, whether it was a conscious thing and um, you always intended to do that or whether you were just thinking of a name and Sarah was the first one that popped into your Do you know what? I, I can't even remember where that is. <laughs> is that really bad? Um... <laughs> It's been a while since I've gone through that book now. Uh, honestly, um, no, I, I it's not. The answer. <laughs> Sorry, Carla, you broke up there, mate. Go on. What did you say? Just, I just think that's you trying to dodge answering the question. <laughs> no, not at all. Honestly, um, no, I find it really hard to find names in there. And so, and I'm very picky about it. So I would have thought, honestly, I, it's gone out of my head at the moment. But I would have thought. I, I'll give you a clue. Jade was showing oh, yes. Daisy some. Oh, yes. Sorry. Yeah. Okay, so he's she's William's daughter. Uh, that's kind of on the, on living the the free life uh, around the world. Um, yeah, so I th I find it hard for, for find names, and if I do, I have to try and relate them in some way. Uh, so I guess that it was you know an easy fit to have someone that's named Sarah that's kind of doing her own thing in that in that respect. So whether that character comes in or not in at some point, I have no idea. Mm. Um, but one of the big things that I've talked about that it could be a prequel in the, in the lineup. And that is a, you know, um, Halo mentioned on the comments about, you know, characters, you know, connecting. And I really think writing the first and second book created so much backstory on its own without any intention that I, I can feel it nagging at me that I have to create this backstory and show, you know, there's a big private company <laughs> um, that's, that Daisy's fighting against. Um, they're a private military that have done really bad, inhumane things, and she is dealing with the result of that. But, you know, it's always there with the characters in the second book that she meets, and you'll understand that, I haven't read it, that again go down that route of she gets a really troublesome, shitty time, and some of those characters really help her, and they're interconnected with characters from the first book and the company so there's there's a real like connection that can go all the way back there and i really think there's a story that can be explored in that respect where you know you find out where the company came from and what the terrible things were that they were all running from which is really interesting i think that's cool that's really cool um is there anything between when you finished book one and then we're writing book two Mm -hmm. Was there anything um, in terms of other books or TV shows or movies or anything that you can you kind of influenced you as you wrote book two? Is there anything that you're like, oh yeah, this is really cool. I'm going to steal that a little bit. Do you know what? I don't. I can't say um, yes on that because I really feel like it was just. You know when someone says that it kind of writes itself. I really feel like this story was just unfolding as it went uh maybe unconsciously pick something up i'm not, I'm not sure um but i i'm i you know if you know me i am really into zombie sort of stuff and films and stuff like that so perhaps there was influence of what i like to see in those sort of genre films um but you know the second book doesn't massively have zombie influence in it so yeah i mean i was going to say that because what what book would you put like categorize this in because the first one was very much horror but like the second one like you just said the horror element kind of takes a back seat mm. so where where would you place it if you had to put it on the shelf do you know what i think this this could be a result of my inexperience as an author but i do think the first book was more horror related the second book was more i guess i it could say thriller but like um 
the prequel could be completely like in conspiracy type um, military involvement thing. So there's so many ways that this story is unfolding. And I kind of like that. But I know probably some people, maybe publishers or whatever. Um, yeah, hello, pre-zombie stuff. So um, it could be... I don't know. I think this is so many different genres in one. And I, I, I've heard that's a bad thing, but I really like the way the story is. Uh, and it's like a whole... Do you know what I mean? If this story was uh, like a TV series, you could play it all the way through and you'd get it. But because it's like, okay, book one had zombies and stuff in it and book two is more evolution of that, but it's not as intense in that respect. It's like, is it different? But it kind of is, but it's the same story. So it's, it's, it's a strange one. It's, I, I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean, the way I kind of see it is I see it as book one was very much the threat was... Monster, like a monster element and a little bit of the human nature and how that can threaten people and then book two was more focused on the the effects of like evilness within people yeah definitely <clears throat> excuse me uh, halo absolutely correct uh, cross genre um i think is good i really like it and I really like where it goes in that respect. And I hopefully, Chris, uh, without giving it away, what happens with those certain characters in that respect, I, I really like the twist of. The one thing is that, like, if you think about it, if you're, you're, if you're writing different genres within the same series, I mean, that's kind of what the, the Marvel Cinematic Universe is doing. They're, they're all, like, yeah, they're all super good. You know, from one movie to the next, they are completely different genres. And I mean, you can argue that Captain America: um, Winter Soldier is uh, seven. It's inspired heavily by seventies spy kind of Cold War esque stuff. And then Doctor Strange is just all magic and interventional. So it, mm. it, it does work. It's just not seen very often in books. But that's not necessarily a bad thing. No, no, I I, I really think it is a good thing, and uh, I kind of hope that you know other people that read it do as well i don't think it takes away from the story at all i think it adds to the way the, the way the story goes so what type of reader do you think chris that uh, would enjoy this story then if we if we're talking about different genres and stuff people like me uh people no honestly and i've i always said this when i wrote the first book and knowingly going into this without a big budget and saying i'm doing this you know i I'm always going to say this, and I really hope it makes a difference to a lot of people's lives. And I don't think it takes away from self-publishing at all, where where I didn't go down spending a lot of money because I can't. And I don't, you know, it's hard to make money off books. You all know this, whether you're published or self-published. So doing things the cheaper way doesn't get you super polished books. It, but the story of my book, is, I think, is really good. So... Uh, <laughs> Yes, Mario, you, you would like this. Um, so I think that it's important to remember that it isn't always about like, you know, getting every single bit of grammar, right? And I know there's a lot of readers that will really focus on those things. And for me, that's someone who's not getting involved in a world. And that's the sort of story, uh, the, the sort of reader that I think would enjoy my book. Someone who is like myself, that when they read a story, they get thrown into their world and that gets taken if you can put yourself in that position, then what's around you will really sort of take you on a journey. Mm. And that's what I think. So, you know, you're sort of more, um, less critical, uh, reader, I guess in that respect, but you know, I don't, I don't look at books in that way. I know I, as an author, I might pick up some, something that I've seen. Okay. I think I would have done that differently, but it doesn't take away from the experience of what I'm reading. Mm. There's a lot of people that would be critical in that sense. And I think it's a waste of a story if you're doing that. So, yeah, so, like, I th I think you're in the sort of, the way I categorize writers is, like, I have two writers that I really quite like, but are very different. So I have Elmore Leonard, who is very dialogue-based, and he writes some of the best dialogue ever in terms of, like, Tarantino sees him as an inspiration for all the stuff he writes and stuff like that. So his dialogue is brilliant. And then I have John Steinbeck on the other side, on the flip side of that, who writes a lot of narrative and really sucks you into the story before anything has even begun um, in terms of dialogue. And I, th I was obviously reading your book today and I thought 
I'm going to see how long it takes Agate's dialogue to start to appear okay. and which type of writer he is. Is he an Elmore Leonard or mm -hmm. is he a John Steinbeck? Now, which, which category do you think that you're in? I couldn't tell you, honestly. I have no idea. I don't even know the answer to that question that you just said. Um, so you've got very descriptive and yeah. and obviously with dialogue eventually because it, it, it has to come into any story or you've got very dialogue driven based. Oh, like, very descriptive and compared to dialogue, I'd say, yeah. Yeah. So I agree. That's mm -hmm. the category I put you in. But what, what makes you think that you're like, why is your storytelling done in that manner? Because obviously we know you really like films and you like watching TV and stuff like that. And your dialogue does come into it towards the, the back end of the novel. There's a lot more dialogue in terms of pace and progression with the dialogue. Mm. But at the beginning, it's very much the narrative structure in terms of description and getting into it. It's almost like you're warming up to the dialogue with the description. Yeah, well, I think if you look at the... If you look... I don't... My phone's about to die, yeah. <laughs> if you look at the i wonder what you're getting out there um if the, the way the story starts you know it's very much it's about daisy being on her own again and her journey is discovering these people and these characters uh and involving relationships so i really felt like it had to grow in that way um you know she had to it's again it's the same as a character arc it, her story is almost the same so she goes from you know on a steep you know, she's running and running and trying to get somewhere and then it builds. So I think I really see things visually, like you said, like mm. TV wise. And that's maybe why I said I started like looking into writing scripts, uh, screenplay. I think I'm very visual in that respect, but it, I don't think the way that is takes away from the story. I think um, I think it was it's supposed to be in that in that way, in that story. I think don't think that mm. story could have gone any other way. Because mm. it's about. Oh, I wasn't saying it takes anything away from mm. the story. I'm just saying it's that you know, there, there are writers that do fall into that category and do like help the reader visualize everything, and then there's writers that don't care about the the sort of setting in a sense, mm. and they just they just sort of run with the action, dialogue, and what's going on. Oh, do you know what I think personally myself? Um, I'm someone who spent a lot of time outdoors. You know, in my history and and. I live by the sea and I just love outdoors. And I think mm. when I talk about it or when I write about it, I try to put you in that place. Mm. Um, so I think, it, I think it's just something that I like. And Brilliant. That, yeah. that leads yeah. perfectly onto my next question. <laughs> Thank you, Halo. That means a lot. Thank you. Yeah. Go on, go on Chris. Perfectly onto my next question, which is, have you ever had an encounter with a bear? <laughs> <laughs> um, I have never had an encounter with a bear. Right, okay. um, not, not you know, I've seen seen them on you know you've been framed perhaps, but uh, mm. no, I've not seen you know. The, obviously, there's a scene in, in the start of the book with a bear. I think it, you know the stats are correct. Uh, you know when I talk about the bear, I've done I do research, but I think it's um it's it's a reflection of the environment, and this is something that you know our American. Um, People or fans of the show, <laughs> listeners, viewers, people, yeah. <laughs> it, it, it came people. across really badly then because you were like, This is something our American. Do you know why? Because the, I'll interrupt people. this because there's a stat, and this, this is a WCCS news flash. And oh. the, yeah, the writing community, this is exclusive right now. The writing community chat show has always been massively dominant, a, a USA fan base for us. You know, and we love that. And you think it's amazing. But just let me drop this up on screen and show you what the current statistics for the USA versus the UK are. <gasps> oh, my goodness. And I'll tell you something now. That used to be, say, 45% USA and maybe 30-odd for the UK. So unless we've lost a lot of followers from around the world, which we haven't because we've got 41 or so countries that kind of tune in, um... You know, that's close. That's very, very close. And, you know, I've kind of always been bigging up the USA, so maybe it'll be the UK soon. Uh, what was I saying? Oh, uh, so my book. <laughs> so the sequel, <laughs> despite never seeing a bear in real life, and despite never having gone to Quebec, the sequel stars 
stars, uh, features a lot of the town <laughs> Quebec um, where Daisy ends up for a long time. So, you know, it's weird that I chose that and I have no idea why I chose that, but it kind of called to me in the story. Um, so that was kind of a, a result of the environment of where she was, why the bear was involved. Uh, I think it works. Do you? What, how do you feel about the bear in that scene? No, I like, I like the bear. Okay. Um, yeah, it, it was a genuine threat, obviously, the bear. Oh, like that, like that sound as well. What was that? I don't know. Connor, is he frozen and playing a harp? What's going on there? <clears throat> I'd love to. I'd love to think that Connor right now is actually not frozen, but he's doing it on purpose. I think that'd be brilliant. Let's all try it. <laughs> <laughs> he is actually frozen. Uh, yeah, okay. I think he is. So my next question, Chris. Well, it's going to be, or is, should I say? Obviously. In book two, you're stepping into very different, like, representations of people. Mm. Um, and how do you feel about the fact that you have addressed that in this book and the potential reaction that you could get as a result? Um, hang on, Carla's just coming back in. Oh, we have a forehead. Uh <laughs> <laughs> I'm the Welcome. worst host, guest host ever. <laughs> my phone just died, so I had to go back to my laptop that crashed earlier. So let's just hope things work out this time. No <laughs> problems. Uh, Chris, I'm sorry. Can you repeat the question, please? Yeah, I just said, obviously, your characters are very different in book two, and they are representing a category of people that you haven't represented before. So how do you feel about that representation and any potential reaction to that representation. Are you referring to the scenes we spoke about earlier? Possibly. In that category of person? Yeah, but, well, I don't want to spoil it because I don't want anyone to to come to it. Like, would it, would it spoil it? I don't know. Maybe. No, but, I, I don't know. No. It's, a, it's obviously a surprise element because obviously in book two, there's no sort of, uh, book one, there's no indication of anything like that because like you said before, Daisy is very much a child really in book one. Yes, of course. So, um, uh, I'm not going to even put the next comment up on there. Um, Go so, on, put it up. Put it up. You kind of have to now, don't you? <laughs> so, um, yeah. So, okay, I, I'm going to say it. Okay, the scenes uh, that are involved with Daisy's character. Oh, should I say it? I I don't know if you should because obviously. It is no, a, let's it not. Is a, let's not. It is a surprise. Well, how, can I answer, how can I answer that question then? Um, well, no, I was just asking you about re potential reactions that you could have. Like, how do you feel about that? Uh, no, my wife said no. I'm not answering that question. So, moving on. Uh, object. <laughs> I object. Rule in the court. Next question, please. Right. I, 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 have a I want a lawyer. I want a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question that will be hopefully tricky to answer, but entertaining to answer. Okay. Um, okay. Dream, who are your dream? Like, if, if somebody reads this and goes, like, This has to be a TV series or film or whatever, um, could you tell us your dream director and Ooh. your dream actor to play Daisy? Oh, um, and it can be living or dead at any age, just to, to really let you so a director, out. yeah. Oh, do you know what? That's really tough. Um, I hadn't thought about that. Can I go on Good. to the actor first? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So I have an actor in mind that um, I've watched the show for quite a while. And I didn't realize until I, I watched it after we had a conversation similar to this before. Um, and just let me get... I'm going to have to find a name now because I'm useless with names. Is that a real name? Oh, it apparently is. So same name of the show. So for me, um, the Fear the Walking <coughs> Dead. Has anyone seen that? Yes, it's like the yeah. Okay, so Alicia from Fear the Walking Dead, I think she would be a fantastic uh, person for this uh, show because she's about like maybe a tiny bit older, but would fit well into that storyline and plays a really kind of rugged in the, and action kind of star without being an action star. You know that vulnerability about her as well. I think that would be fantastic in terms of a director. Wow. Um, I don't know. I like kind of gritty. I like the kind of, um, I like a story to be sort of well told, but kind of hides things. 
as well. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. I couldn't really tell you who that would be in terms of a director. Um, so I'm a bit useless to answering that one. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's all right. I suppose you kind of answered it in the sense of you want a, a more subtle director and you want someone that... <laughs> hey, look, <well> <laughs> <laughs> just, just a little bit just waiting for october you know yeah hey danny um so what uh, here's here's another question regards uh, it's less to do with the books and more to do with writing a sequel and everything okay when but just when you started saying to yourself right i'm going to write a sequel now and you're sitting down was there anything that you actively changed about your writing process because you were consciously making an effort to improve does that make sense so like is there anything you're like all right i'm not going to do this anymore i'm going to do this instead because i think that'll make me a better writer i massively tried to work on my sentence structure as something that was uh, kind of pulled up before and uh something i did in the first book was use something as simple as if you're if you're someone who's listening to the show and you're new at writing spell check doesn't pick up words you write correctly that are wrong and yeah. that sounds kind of funny. So I was writing form a lot instead of from. Uh, and so I adapted the F, F, control F search button. But in terms of like, I found an app that was called, uh, it's on our website now. Hemingway. Hemingway. Thank you. Yeah, well done. Like you could read his mind. <laughs> I know, I know. Um, so Hemingway app. And it was very much uh, talks about how to simplify your sentences. And simplifying them isn't always a great thing to a you know a real simple um perspective but to it, it highlights really complicated sentences so i kind of used that to my advantage to try and learn in that respect and every bit of advice i had i took and try to adapt and i didn't just if someone said oh this could change in that respect i didn't just go okay change it mm -hmm. i actually kind of looked and studied at why it needed changing uh, and so then when i was writing naturally i've just found myself writing better sentences and then looking back at things I'd done and thinking, oh, I changed that, I changed that. So it was almost a learning curve that I just, it was a real drive to want to improve. And I think if you have that, you will find every sort of reason to improve that's there. Mm. Uh, so I think it's just a more of a case of the willing to that kind of led on to that, I guess. So in terms of improving in writing stuff then, Stephen King has a phrase that says, kill, you, kill your darlings, basically. So any scenes in there that don't work for the book you get rid of. Is there any scenes that you did write, but then got rid of them? And if so, what were the scenes and why? Um, do you know what? I I don't think so. Like I can think of the top of my head. I don't think I deleted any scenes particularly. I definitely went back and changed and adapted and, um, and <laughs> sorry, it's just Halo's questions coming don't kill all my characters hell no um so no i definitely improved scenes a lot and and what i do is with my style of writing like i said a panzer style i'm quite quick at plotting out a story not plotting but creating a story so i will just sit there and say oh this happens in my head you know the story the, the characters go this way and this develops and these people come in and they they're connected this way and it just comes out and then when i go back over you know talk about the meat on the bones this mm. is where i really go okay how do I detail this and how do I make it a bit more punchy and effective? Uh, and that's where the difference comes in. I don't think at some point I've gone, okay, that scene shouldn't be there. I've gone, okay, how can I make that scene work? Mm. Uh, as opposed to delete it. So I, I can't say I have. And one, one of the things I noticed from a reader's perspective when I was reading your books is paragraphs in this book were used much more, uh, how did I say it, like purposeful in a sense okay. like what i found was that like you said about that punchy element they were there for that um so was that something that you subconsciously or consciously looked at in terms of writing and your structure mm. i think uh, is again directly a result of wanting to improve mm. and, you know um really <laughs> I don't want to say them put people off the first book. I think the first book is great and the story's great, but I was I was a young, very naive author at that point, and where I was ending things on a good end for each chapter, and it made people want to come back. And people have said that many times that they wanted to go back and read and read and read and read, mm. but 
I just think I learned to a point where it really meant more in those sort of paragraphs and it was more effective as mm. a whole story rather than just the end point. So I think it was just a development evolution thing where I was trying to learn and it was a result of that. So not and what, to, what made you sort of title the chapters in, in this book? What made you do that? Um, do you know what? I've, I've noticed some books that really quite the titles, I don't notice why they're like that. And sometimes I do. Uh, and I'm quite, I guess, um, I'm really kind of thoughtful about what the chapters are called. And so some of them are kind of simple and some of them are a bit more, you know, it's like a, a highlight of the chapter. I don't know. Mm. I, I just try to write something that kind of incorporates the whole thing. Like you, when you name a book, if it's not the name of something specific in the book, like Deep isn't, you know, it's kind of a me metaphor for the character is deep, the story is deep and everything, you know, whereas the chapters, I try to make a metaphor for the for the chapter. So I don't know, it's kind of a weird thing, but I don't know why I do that. Hmm. Was there any any moments in there where you put little snippets and little hints to what back that drop back to book one for the readers where you thought, oh, they'll really like it if I just say this about Daisy because they'll get it because they read the first one? Um, do you know what? Not directly. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, not directly. I think uh, there is a lot of reference, like I mentioned before, where the prequel is, is begging to come out of the story uh, because the characters that became connected with characters that already were and the characters that connected were because of a backstory, not directly involved with Daisy, but Daisy was a result of a lot of this. And to the point where you may have noticed, like I mentioned William earlier, like they had, he was a lot older and he was someone who cared for her. And at some point, their history connected. And I don't know where that came from. And I was like, oh, that's, I really like that. So it, they're so interconnected without even knowing it at the time, that it kind of all begs for backstory. So not directly hints at the sort of last book, apart from, I guess, where Daisy is going through a hard time, she always refers back to what Eli kind of taught her. Because, you know, when she was growing up in the first book, he was kind of her instructor type father. And he taught her a lot of stuff, but wasn't really that caring father figure or parent figure that she needed. So I think that I don't know. I think there was a lot of reference to that because it's her natural, uh, you know, if you're up against it, you naturally go back to what you were taught or what you trained. And I think that's where it comes through in that respect. Mm. So an interesting thing from my point of view, obviously, as a reader that's read both of your books now and is also looking forward to the audio book of book one, are you going to have the same person do aud the audio book for book two? Yes, I am. Uh Caden, her name is, and she is fantastic. Uh, we talk, we spoke about ACX before. Drew, AC Merkel came on the show, and I was blindly giving up on my dream of an audiobook, and I'm someone who likes an audiobook. So for me, I kind of wanted to get it out there, and AC Merkel came on and spoke about ACX.com, which is kind of, again, I guess a cheaper way of getting this done, um, but in a way that, you know, we're still you get the production made and you would get people to audition for your book. And, you know, yourself, Chris, we spoke about this where for quite a while I struggled to get the voice I wanted for a long time, in fact, until a point where the weeks went past with no auditions. And I thought that I thought the dream was over again <laughs> um, until someone else came on the show. And forgive me, I don't know who that is. Can't remember. Um, but they said that you can actually approach the, the voice actors, the narrators um, for your story. So I found one. So if you're looking for an audiobook production, we actually split split royalties. So it's not quite out yet. It takes 30 days. And Connor, you mentioned this to me to actually. It takes so long. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I was like, I'll get out next week. You're like, nah, you won't. <laughs> <laughs> so it takes 30 days or so to, to process. So 30 working days even. So that's exactly. That's, it's, it's, uh, it's you know, it's not a month. It's not at all. So it took a long time and uh, it's still taking a long time. But she was fantastic. I really, really found a good one. But I, she hadn't had many titles done and I w reached out and straight away, she's like, yeah, cool. So again, uh, if you're like the budget author, um, you don't have to pay anything up front and you split royalties and she's agreed to do the second book because she really enjoyed the story. So I think it's fantastic and I can't wait. I, um, 
I keep getting chapters through that she's completed, and I think I'll just have a quick listen to check. I end up listening to the whole story, <laughs> the whole chapter, and thinking, oh, where's the next one? And I was like, it's my own story. How stupid is that? But, you know, I think it's fantastic. Can't wait. Good, good. Were you tempted at all to, b- before you found the right voice, like, because obviously you're comfortable with a microphone yourself. Um, so were you not tempted to just read it yourself and record it yourself? Or uh, Yes. Um, thank you, Connor. And I did do that. Uh, <laughs> and it was on my website for a very brief moment. I actually um, heard that. I thought you did a good job, to be honest. I thought it was good. Do you know what? Um, I had really good feedback for, for that the introduction of that story. And I thought, do you know what? People actually think this is all right. So, do you know what? I'll, I'll, I'll make an effort. And uh, when it got to dialogue, it completely went out the window. So <laughs> there's a tip for you guys. Before, if anyone wants to do their own audiobook, just try and do the characters' voices first. Because if you can't do those, don't bother. <laughs> I, I was trying to do like a Daisy's voice and then it was a different accent. She went from a Geordie to a New Zealand uh, to a bloody South African. I don't know what she was talking about, but it wasn't good. So yeah, we've that's... talked about this in the past in terms of as a male author writing from a largely female perspective, mm. like how how did you get into that sort of mindset in terms of Daisy was very young in the first one. She was growing up in the second one. Like a lot of people probably would would ask, like, how do you know how what a <laughs> you know t- teenage girl thinks? So, do you know what? Um, I'm someone who really likes people, and I get on with people well, and I like to talk to people. But I also grew up with my three sisters and my mum, uh, mm. and I have a very female kind of orientated family, and. I don't know. I, I just really kind of felt that the story had to be told from Daisy's perspective. And I really felt like I could tell it. And I didn't see any issue with that. And I didn't feel like the fact that I was a man took away from that. Uh, I kind of think I captured it quite well. Um, and even Jade, I think she came across quite well. And I, 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 do you know what? I love Paige. I think she's a fantastic character in the books. And, you know, she's really strong. She's an over, uh, she's a powerful lady that kind of oversees a lot. Um, so I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure why that happened. Um, but a lot of my characters were in that kind of, uh, I guess what maybe. Would you ever be tempted to do like, um, what Stephanie May has done in terms of she had the Twilight books written from Bella's perspective and now she's released one from Edward Cullen's perspective. Would you ever be tempted to do it from maybe Eli's point of view? Uh, Do you know what? Wow. Wouldn't that be a story from Eli's perspective? And um, without giving stuff it's away, happening right there, right now. He's like, "Ooh, I'm <laughs> gonna do that." <laughs> do you know what? I, I, oh, if I was a talented writer in that respect, to really kind of change the story to a darker perspective, and you know, without giving stuff away, uh, Eli's character arc takes a big turn in book two as well. Um, it would be interesting. Very interesting. And do you know what? It could be. The prequel could be from that perspective. You never know. I mean... <laughs> it started here, <laughs> um, <laughs> On camera. <laughs> the options the options are, you know, the, you know yourself, we spoke about this just off air. The story can still go anywhere, even though the ending is kind of tied up. And the prequel could go anywhere. And there really is a world that could grow. And do you know what? Even if there was another, st- I've had another thought of a story at some point that could connect very loosely to this story or the same world. So it, it, I think it's a big story that I've got that could go anywhere. It could go anywhere. Mm. Well, let's ask you some like writing community chat show <laughs> questions now because we are on the writing community chat show even if we're live. Um, so obviously the first one, is if you could change the end into any book, which book could it be and why? Uh, okay, I will I will answer this. And it's not a dig at this story at all because I absolutely loved it. And I read uh, Tim Levin's Eden last year. No, this year. It, this week yeah, is a blur. This year is <laughs> a blur. Um, and I really like that story, how, you know, it's about, it's a really cool concept of like these uh, virgin sort of zones in the world. Because the world's polluted and it's dying and it's got these virgin zones that were kind of left for to kind of save humanity. And it was a fantastic concept. And I love the idea of the, all these sort of ultra runners thinking, right, we're going to conquer these by, it's illegal to go in them, but we're going to run across them as fast as we can and we'll get the record. Loved that concept. 
And the problem that I had with the ending wasn't his fault. It was a concept that I built up in my mind that I thought the ending's going this way and the ending's going to be like this. And I had a vision of the ending that wasn't that way. And the ending he had was completely fine. It's just I kind of really wanted the ending that I thought had, I thought in my head. So I think I changed that ending and uh, I couldn't even tell you. It was kind of weird that the ending, without giving stuff away, there was a lot of sort of nature and stuff involved with this ending. But I really wanted it to come from within humans. Um, like nature sort of overtaking the human sort of person and then sort of decaying them as they were, whoa, as they were sort of, you know, trying to trying to save themselves, but it was kind of decaying them at the same time. I really kind of saw that vision, but it didn't play out that way. So I would change that. Sorry about that. I thought I could subtly turn the light on and it would get a bit lighter and it was just like a spotlight. <laughs> I got disco lights here. Yes, it's weird. But not if, disco. If your light is the only problem. At least you're not the one dropping in and out of the uh, interview you're supposed to be. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Is there a book that you read that you ever thought to yourself, oh man, I wish I thought of that? Like, what, what's the one book you're like, I wish what? I read that? 100% Max Brooks, World War Z. I yeah. fucking love that book. Uh, and because that book is is a zombie book, but it's an oral history of a world war against zombies. And that concept in itself is fucking brilliant. But what the amount of perspective that guy goes into and tells it from so many different so, uh, sides of a story and it just throws you into world after world after world where you think, shit, I didn't think of that. And shit, I wish I thought of that. And it's constant. And, yeah. I, and then, you know, when the film came out with Brad Pitt, I thought, oh, I can't wait for this. And the only comparison I remember from the film and the book was the guy's name. And I thought, oh, come on. There was just so many things in there, that are massive wars, massive battles, and mass, you know, uh, Spaceman seeing it, the outbreak from space and so many cool things that they just didn't touch in that film. So I really hope that if they come back, they, they adopt some of those amazing concepts. Um, we, we talked a bit about audiobooks earlier. I don't know if you've listened to the audiobook of it, but the audiobook of it is easily one of the best audiobooks I've ever listened to because there's so many different perspectives from different countries, uh, yeah. and they actually got a different actor for every single wow. person. And they were, and they're like, there's a, a whole, there's two main characters from Japan, if I remember correctly, and they actually got two different Japanese actors. Wow. Um, well, I have not, Connor, but I will put that on my list. Absolutely. Thank you. So, Chris, another one of the sort of writing community staple questions that we ask is, have you ever considered writing in any other? I know we've talked about genres with you today, and it's not necessarily that your book is tied into one genre, but would you ever consider writing something completely different and just taking yourself out of your comfort zone? I have, um, and I am, uh, kind of. But, like, you know, that screenplay that I have is an idea that's definitely in the horror it's definitely more horror, completely horror. Absolutely homage to old old school horror in the way of deaths. <laughs> um, but uh, but what I fancied writing is a, you know, it, it's it's a weird one, and it's done. It's been done quite a few times in different aspects of the story. I'm trying to tell. I I kind of guess that a lot of my stories that I want to write are different molds of a lot of stories I've seen or heard about. Uh, but I really want to write a space story. And and mm. sci-fi is something that I've never really been massively into, but I've got a a little niggling to get this story out there. So there's a there's a sci-fi esque story that I really want to write. I nice. can tell you why. I'm going to put that light in, but I'm going to try and start it out a bit. So, is there any character then that uh, you know taken from fiction, and you can have a crack at it? You can have your own go. Is there any character that you'd pick, and who's that character, and why? Uh, it's um, it's a really good question, and I, we we ask this every week, and I should have a fantastic answer, but I don't. <laughs> but the one that springs to mind is is Batman. Um, I love Batman, nice. and I love what they've done with Batman many times. And Christian Bale's Batman for me is is the latest one that I really like. Uh, not a massive fan of Ben Affleck Batman. Sorry if you're watching. The fact they put him in a big suit. <laughs> sorry, yeah, Ben Affleck. Yeah, if you're watching, if you're watching. Totally rubbish, mate. Big shit suit. Sorry, mate. Just get <laughs> off. Um, but, but buy Chris's book while you're here. Yeah, <laughs> please. And make a film. Uh, great. Yeah, and you can be in and, it if you want. 
Yeah. Just don't just don't be, be Batman. Just be Daisy. <laughs> um oh, I'd be a great Eli actually. Yeah, it'd be in my film. Uh so uh, yeah, but I think Batman is one of those characters. You know, all super superhero films are everywhere and, and kind of what I love about Batman is that he's a a, a man. Uh, he is a man that's <laughs> he's vulnerable and he's kind of put himself out there with his, his kind of riches. No, I'm not laughing at that. What my point is that he is just an average guy. I, I get what you're saying, but that just that just proper tickled me. All right, well, fuck you. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so what I love about Batman is he's a man. He's a man. Uh, he's a man, man. So, so, do you know what I mean? He he has a lot of money. He puts it into uh, technology, and he just goes and fights crime and fucking batters scumbags. So, uh, I think Batman's a great character. Who's the best looking Batman? I don't know. George, Tim Burton. Uh, t- Tim Burton. <laughs> <laughs> Not Tim Burton. Uh, what's his name? He did the Tim Burton Batman. Michael Keaton. Michael Ke- Mike Keaton. Yeah, Michael Keaton. Uh, yeah. Yeah, Tim Burton would make a terrible Batman. He'd make a well, great no. peng- penguin, but. Yeah, he would. Uh, yeah, I guess. I was going to say the joke is fantastic as well. And he, they, a lot of people have had a crack at Joker recently. Um, Joaquin Phoenix as the Joker is. is oh, I, I he's haven't the seen this yet. Um, what? But for, no. Change but that right you, now. It's a great film. If this if this persuades me that that uh, Heath Ledger is not the, the best Joker, then I'll be very impressed. They're very different styles of Joker. But also, mm. uh, you said something already. I want to correct you on Christian Bale is not the best Batman. Go on. Ooh. Kevin Conroy is the best Batman. Okay. Kevin Conroy is the man who voices the animated Batman uh, from the '90s cartoon, as well as in most of the animated video uh animated films and video games and everything and he is the voice i hear when i'm reading a batman story he's the voice i hear i reckon i get could do a good batman voice i reckon you should do your batman voice right now i'm batman <laughs> is that good yeah. i don't know hello yeah. that was quite good yeah i i could do a, a say a, i'm batman and uh, say i'm batman and i like to go deep <laughs> I'm Batman and I like to go deep. <laughs> Real deep. Um if you could team up with any writer or for a book, who would it be? Um <laughs> <laughs> Um You've been you know a <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, what was that? You, I said Mario has made you go red. Well done, Mario. It doesn't take much for me. I'll, it's, whoop. Uh, <laughs> do you know what? Um, I don't know. Uh, who would I write with? Someone who can write good dark stuff. Um, I think we've already had her on the show a few times. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, there's, a, there's a woman coming to mind that we all know very well. Yes, but this is the thing that I still haven't got round to. And I know, I know, uh, my to be read list is fucking enormous. And I really want to read this. Uh, <laughs> and but <laughs> I think Halo probably would be a great shout, yeah. And I don't know, I haven't really read it, so I can't say. But the concepts and what everyone said about it probably very good. And you know what? I actually thought that when I write the, there was another story I was going to write before this prequel that wasn't really directly connected, but it was a big project. And I thought I need someone who's really good to write it with. So I I have thought about um teaming up with someone to write a book but I just because I need the experience of a really good writer to do that so who knows that might be on the cards yeah um I think Halo would be my answer for, for that as well if you want someone dark I have read uh Brett Ellis's American Psycho all those years ago and um there's pretty horrific scenes in that but um <laughs> Yeah, Halo, Halo could make Brett run, make, take a run for his money because oh, I, I can't, I cannot oh. wait to get in this book. I tell you, yeah, no, it's brilliant. Yeah, I think if I had to answer it, I'm going to say because obviously you've answered it and Connor's answered it now, so I'm going to say Rush Young because mm. his humor for me, like, is just amazing. He's just, he's not even like dad joke territory. He's just you, hilarious. Can I do this before I forget? And, and there's only two people watching currently. I don't know if that's at all, but let me, can I play the trailer for my book? You can indeed. Oh, do, yeah. I'm not sure if the sound will come through. Let me know if it's not. And this is a trailer made by Ross. So 
please uh, let me... well, let's watch this. I actually haven't seen. Oh no, I did see this. It's Can you hear this? No. No. Uh, uh, <laughs> don't worry about it. It's fine. It's going. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Go on, yes. Yeah, sing the sound. Ooh. It's just very droney, uh, like dramatic. Ooh. <laughs> so don't talk us through this, Chris. How, how oh, okay, okay, did Ross yeah. make this trailer? Like, what did you have to tell him? Did you give him the book and did he read it? Or? He has. He's had the books, but um, in fact, no, he's read them. He's read them both. So thank you, Ross, um, for taking the time. So me, deep, wicked. Um, so forest, river, very relevant to book two. Ah, uh, oh, this is going to give away something anyway that people have seen. So she grows up in a, in a thing in the woods and gets there in the second book. Uh, virus, obviously, is a big effect in book one. Uh, the organization known as Ark, so a big bunch of bastards. They experiment on people that shouldn't be experimented on. Uh, they caused an outbreak of panic and destruction in book one. Daisy was in a world of shit. Still is. Uh, there was an outbreak. There was uh, book two torture scenes. Uh, Daisy, uh, super getting, finding herself in book two. Um... Drones were after her in book two. So again, great scene. Um, experiments. Needle, very significant. And there you go. That uh, highlights a lot of shit in those those two books. So what was the process of that video? Like, did you, did you give Ross the books and he read them and then made the video? Or did he speak to you about what you wanted in the video and the trailer? Um... Oh crap! Sorry, cut that off quick. Ross's um, making video making skills are fantastic, and he, yes, he actually did that on the back of he kind of you know what my story was like. He's read the first book, and I sent him the second, and he read it just to understand the process of that video. So the time and effort put into that, I really respect and thank you so much, Ross, because it's fantastic. And as I mentioned there, I commentated through every scene. Um, it's all relevant to the story massively. And in a really good sequence, so thank you. And hopefully, if anyone's watching and wants to buy the book, then please do so as a result of that video. I think I think that's interesting that you did get him to read it because I know that it's something a lot of people ask me sometimes is uh, when I was getting, when you get your cover designed for your novel, a lot of people outside of the world of writing assume the cover designer, if you don't do it yourself, uh, has to read the book beforehand. But... Hmm. Not necessarily, uh, and it, it, so it's interesting that a trailer, because I suppose it, it's a it's a lot more detail in a trailer mm. than there is on a cover. Um, so that's interesting that there's that little bit of a difference. Yeah, I think so. And Connor, your cover is really interesting because I looked at it today, um, yeah. in t just having a little Twitter stalk on who was coming on the show to host the show, um, and we actually spoke about your cover in season one at some point because i remember talking about it really yeah i'm gonna have to look this up now because i can't remember we definitely did i get because our as soon as i saw it i remember what i said about it Connor, what's you book you might remember it as well the, long, the longest night uh please, please please tell me what you said was a positive thing <laughs> <laughs> we slagged it right off because <laughs> i can't remember I, I don't remember you mentioning it I listened to season one. They don't. Oh, talk. we have seen that cover. We have. Didn't we put it, it on the show? Uh, I was at the book. The, the I sponsored you one one episode. Isn't so. that what it was, Chris? Or did we actually? It, no, yeah, it might we, have been that. It might have been. No, that. it was because we've seen it before. Did you do it in? Um, did we? You, did you do a? Because we would do a thing. We were, fuck. We've forgotten to do that. We we. Yeah, it was like a writer's left, and we bought some books, and that was one of the books that was in there. Yeah, and I remember talking to you about it on the show, Chris. That is true. That is true. Um, do you know what we said we'd do and I haven't done? No, oh, I'll yeah, do the live I'll, ones. I'll do a we'll special, do I'll do a separate video for this. Sorry. Uh, mm. I was going to buy three books tonight as a celebratory thing. Uh, oh, fuck, we're giving the books away. I've got to give books away, but there's only three people on the fucking thing a minute. Uh, well, hopefully, more people will watch it over the next <laughs> few days. But basically, <laughs> I said I'll give my book away. Book one and two, sign, send. Um, and I know I've got to send two to um, Bad Grandma. I owe her two. And then mm. I'm going to send... Uh, she probably hasn't watched it. She's not going to watch this. But Kristen Bailey sent me some books that was fantastic for my wife to read. So I'm going to send her two without her knowing about it. So hopefully she still lives in the same place. Um, 
that can become <laughs> super orcs. Uh, but I'm going to give two away to someone on the show as well. So I reckon uh, you should give at least one to one of the three that are watching now. It's down to one, mate. I don't know. <laughs> uh, who, who, who's still here? <laughs> who's, who's still here? If you comment on the thing, I'll send you a book. It's probably Mario. Let's see. And if it's Mario, Agate will also say whatever you want him to say in Batman's voice for a good 30 seconds. Mario is typing furiously. 30 seconds. Okay, at, at least two tweets. So Chris Agate will say the two tweets that you type. Yes, Mario. Yes. Man. <laughs> Chris Agat will say the two tweets that you send, not the next one, not the next one, the one after that, he will say them live on the show in Batman's voice. So oh, do I, your best. Let's, let's get Twitter open because I haven't got Twitter open on my screen. Um, so what, what we're going off the show's all, page? All tabs closed for fear of everything crashing again. <laughs> oh, yeah, I know. Uh, let's have a look. CJ Agus book live. Who's, who's done that? Um, that's the show. <laughs> okay. Oh, oh, he said it. <laughs> what? <laughs> what <did I> said? <laughs> come on, <laughs> come on. I I can't see any tweets of Nick, so I don't know. You got, can you guys keep it on the tweets? It's on the uh, it's on the chat for the uh, yeah. The... <laughs> oh, go on, uh, put it up, put it up, put it up. On. Batman's voice. Uh, oh, I gotta read that. Yeah, you got yeah. to read what Mario just said. Oh, do I? Twice. Yeah. Oh, I can't do what I'm laughing. I want you now. Deep. So deep. You know you want me. <laughs> Alfred. <laughs> 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 so that was your first one, Mario. You got another one. I don't know, uh, Sarah, you haven't sent hearts. I don't know what... Uh... Oh, she... If she's watching it live and she's clicking it, you'll see the hearts afterwards. Be like, oh, we don't see those. No, we don't, shame, we, don't, we don't. We don't. We don't. But when you watch it back, you'll see when people have liked oh, okay, stuff we've okay. been talking about and stuff. It, and yeah. Up. Bravo. Thank you. Right. <laughs> Next one, Mario. You've got one left. Make it a good one. One more. Is this a forfeit? Did I miss this? Oh, make it no. a tongue twister. Mm. Oh, good. Don't do a tongue Batman twister. That's just crazy. <laughs> You'll be well able for it, don't worry. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Mario, you don't, don't even have here. Um. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is it Angry Batman? Shall I do Angry Batman? No, Shut me Batman. To my head. that was not Batman. <laughs> <laughs> Sexy Batman, I get. Come on. Let me chilly. Do my hair. <laughs> <laughs> I've lost him. I've lost him. Yeah, he's gone. Oh, uh, Batman's gone. <laughs> Batman's it. We can pull his own hair. Uh, do my hair. Do my hair. I don't know. I think Mario's drunk. Um, <laughs> I'm, not sure, I'm not sure what's going on there. <laughs> okay. Are we, are we closing the end of the show? Is this coming up? or? Well, well, that, I'm, really go, I'm only a guest host. I, don't, I feel I don't have that power. <laughs> so, Agat, who has been your favourite guest that we've had on the show? Ooh. That's and you don't have to feel the pressure to say me. because I. Been... <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. It's all right, I wouldn't. <laughs> um, do you know what? It's a tough one. That's a very tough one, because we've had some really good interviews, and some really interesting people. Really interesting. Um, I just love the ones that make us laugh a lot. And there's been a few. There's been a few. Thank you, Mario. Uh, it means a lot, and I hope you enjoy the book. Um, you should have put a full stop at the end of the book. Just saying. Um, <laughs> <laughs> brilliant, Mario. <laughs> Maybe he's not finished. Uh, uh, there yeah, he's, he's come, more more <laughs> sentence to come. Um, he's gone. Uh, one, one. What was the question? Uh, your favorite guest? Oh, favorite guest. Show. Yeah, I think the ones that make me laugh. I loved Kristen. One we've got coming up. Um, CJ uh, CD CD Major Major was very funny. Yeah. And and I honestly, guys, you've got to watch this show when it comes out. 
the opening. I, I think that has the potential to go viral. Oh my goodness, it must. When we we opened the scene, we said, "Let's introduce CD Major." We added her to the stream, and she was pushing her naked four-year-old child out of the shed, uh, live on the show. Get out! Get out! Get out! It was like it's it's one of those things that can go around the internet quite easily. Um, fuck, it's fantastic. So I think I, I think I saw her tweet about that because I saw the the like she tweeted that gif of you know that guy from um, yeah. On the, I think it was on Sky News, and his wife came running in, yanking the child out of the bedroom or something. So. Yeah, I definitely saw that. But, but she, I, I know, it's very similar. Yeah, she was the one doing the pushing. Oh, it was so funny. Just like, get out! <laughs> get out. Uh, so. I don't know, it's such a hard choice. We've had so many guests now. We're knocking on, you know, it must be 30, 40, 40? I, t- I tell you the one where I really thought, oof. Agat definitely stepped up his game there. Um, and it was Dom Jolly because <laughs> we, we spoke to each other before it. And I was like, oh, I'm going to ask Dom Jolly to do this thing and it'd be really funny. And obviously, he's famous for Trigger Happy. <laughs> and um, I asked him to do the Trigger Happy entrance and just say that he was in a podcast with people that he didn't know. And uh, hello. Can I, can, I say, can I say what he said? Yeah. He said, uh, no, I'm not doing that. Yeah, but really deadpan as well. That was it. And was I that- was like, I was really enthusiastic. And I was like, Don, this would be great. It'd be really funny if you did this. And uh, can you do it? And he's like, no, I'm not doing that. And I was like, I was in shock for like 10 minutes after that. Like yeah. really just like, oh my God, I've offended him. I don't know what to say to him now. <laughs> and then I got just completely stepped in and stepped up his like interviewing game. And like everything he said Dom Jolly responded to like, oh my god, yeah, I love that. And like, that's just... not entirely true, because <laughs> the very been... first, very introduction, I said, oh, you've had a few books out, and I meant you've had a few books. Do you know what I mean? You've had a few yeah. books out. You went, I've had seven actually. I was yeah. like, oh shit, <laughs> you fucking annoyed him. I pissed him off. But no, we we steadied the storm pretty quickly, and he actually really enjoyed the show. So it was yeah. it was a great interview with someone who's who's seen those shows when I was younger, um, and. It, it, that man has some bloody stories to tell you. A travel writer that has been some places does, you know, danger traveling. I don't know what you call it, but wow. Mm. What a great. It's really movie. funny because I remember when we recorded that, like when we had, oh, what's the guy called that did the, the zombie shows? But you were like, oh, Casey Whalen. Yeah, oh, Casey Whalen. When I, Casey Whalen was wow. on. Wow. You didn't That's th- my worst interview. Worst interview. You, like you just were completely f- you fangirled completely. And then I had to kind of step in and I knew nothing about the guy. <laughs> so I did I was asking I... him all these questions. Uh it was, it was just hilarious. No, and no then Clark. the same happened with Dom, obviously. No Clark, Dom Jolly. I thought, you know, I got this. Yeah. Until I called him Ashley. Uh oh, that was so funny. <laughs> oh fuck it. So hell. funny. We got to the end of the interview. The whole interview was great. And he was like, <laughs> really appreciated. We spoke to him about Pokemon and we took him to a different level where he's never kind of been before. And he really enjoyed it. And then right at the end, Agate goes, thanks, Ashley. <laughs> no, was it was the like, last thing oh I said to him. God. Like We had an hour interview of, of nailing it. In, in When he had kids running around in his kitchen, his wife talking, drilling in the background. It was a nightmare. <laughs> We nailed it, and I called him Ashley. The last thing I said to him, but even after all that, when it came to Casey Wayland, ah, I just couldn't. I just couldn't do anything. I, my mouth wasn't working. I don't know what was going on. Mm. And then when we finished it, all the audio was fucked. Like we couldn't even hear us. Oh. Uh, and so we had to like, ah, it took us hours. Oh, it took me hours. Um, mm. But oh wow. Uh, yeah, there's been so many good. Like, do you know what? This has been going. We're nearly the end of season two, basically, and. Mm. And it's just been a hell of a ride already. We've got so many memories. This this is wicked. I love it. Um, so I'm very grateful. Very yeah, grateful. like, if you could have a dream guest for season three, Ooh. because I've been thinking about this, because every dream guest that I kind of wanted, with the exception of Stephen King, we had on this, this like, everyone I asked was like, yeah, sure. And these were the people that I was reading and I had on my Kindle yeah. and I enjoyed and stuff. And I thought... Wow, there's literally no one left for me like that I would want to interview in terms of, you know, that I'm a fan of and that I enjoy reading. Mm. Um, so who who would be your like dream? I, guest? I reckon, I reckon, 
it's not going to suggest this is my all-time favorite, and it's just someone I can think of top of my head right now. That mm. someone's got a book coming out at the moment is Norman Reedus from The Walking Dead. Ah, yeah, yeah. He's writing a fiction book, which is very cool, but mm. he is the all you know. He is he's he's Norman Reedus, so he's a very cool character. He's been there from day since day one um, in The Walking Dead, and he's a huge, huge person. So I think if he was to come on and talk about his book, I think that would be pretty damn awesome. Mm. And, and there's no reason why. I don't, I don't know. Maybe we can get him on. Um, you might have saw that I asked Liam Gallagher to come on this morning. I did. And do you know what? <laughs> um, I hope he does, because I'll tell him. I, uh, I wasn't a massive fan when I was younger. <laughs> I, 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 I'm sure that'll go down really well, Chris. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> why not? And and at the moment, um, do you know what? Yay, Anya Pavel's on. Um, hey, Anya. Hello. Uh, I kind of. Anya, like... do you want Chris Agat to say something in Batman's voice? If you do, just type it. I have to cook dinner. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think I think he would be absolutely wicked. So if someone can tag him, Norman Reedus, come on the show, please. Uh, yeah. So Connor, who's your? Obviously, you've got a podcast now. Um, one, you... tell tell us a little bit about the show, and two, who's your dream uh, guest that you would like to have on? Well, my podcast is called Story of a Storyteller. Uh, and the whole idea behind it is um, to learn about the life story of different storytellers. And I'm starting, like, uh, I'm going to do it in seasons like yourselves. Um, and season one, I have only one uh, podcast left to record, and that's yourself, Mr. Hoovy. Um, nice. Mr. Agate, you are episode one as well. So uh, that's really cool. Um, in terms of dream, I did, I did, I do have one person on season one that I'm, I'm ridiculously hugely excited about is a, an Irish children's author called Sarah Webb, mm. and she has been a full time, traditionally published author here in Ireland since the late nineties. Mm. Uh, she has like forty books out. So I actually got to talk to her. I just contacted her on her website, just mm. thinking, no way. And then she responded saying, yeah, that sounds like great fun. Um, <laughs> and I was sweating buckets when I was interviewing her because <laughs> I was so nervous because I have read her books as a kid as well myself. So hmm. it was kind of a huge deal. In terms of future people, um, I don't know, just anybody. I'd love to talk to um, some actors and some directors and stuff because they're storytellers as well. Mm -hmm. um, the one director I'd love to talk to more than anybody would be Jodie Foster. Wow! So I'm nice. aiming high. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> I mean, it's great that you 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 creating a podcast around the similar sort of lines, and it's fantastic we can cross over. And uh, you know, the writing community is renowned for helping people and lifting people, and yeah. this is no different. And the fact that we can you know, at some point cross ideas over and all sorts of things that on combined at some point. I mean, we talked openly about how we would love to go on like some sort of book conference tour thing, you know, even if we went to the UK and we met all our UK fans that came, even if there's three people turned up, we wouldn't care. We were like, okay, we're yeah. at the book conference, we're learning, we're engaging, and there's someone listening to the show, we're like, fuck yeah. But you know, <laughs> that we want that to involve into like we go to like a US and like three years down the line and we got sponsors and like there's fucking hundreds of people there. And you know, that's what I want. So there's no reason why that can't happen between for all of us. And you guys come in the same. And it's just about growth and, and getting the right mindset. Mm. And I think that... And, yeah, aiming big as well, like you say about Jodie Foster. But when we yeah. started this show, there's no way we even dreamed that Noel Clark or Dom Jolly or, you know, yeah. any of the authors that we asked like to come on. Like, I remember speaking to Halo the first time because obviously I'd read a book. I was I enjoyed it just as much as everybody else has, and I was like, "Oh, it's a big deal!" Like, you know, getting to speak to Halo, like the first person. I think we were the first people to interview Halo, um, do, which do, was do really know, exciting and really nerve wracking cool. as well. The writing community chat show because we were right interviewing indie authors. We had to mm. create another show because of the the ability we had to attract bigger guests. So that became two shows, and then we're like, we need another show. So we got like, three fucking shows on the go now. Mm. Uh, it, it's it's like wow i can't believe it but you know we've got to still build our audience and we still got to build our listenership and and all that stuff so there's a lot of work to be done but I, it's just a it's the do you know what I, i've had 
wanting to do something different for a while and in just like a hobby and stuff and this is just filled that spot massively and it's a big commitment and don't get me wrong you kind of you'll learn this do you if you haven't already that it's, <laughs> uh, it's a busy it's a busy busy job um yeah. and yeah. <laughs> it takes commitment so uh, you know there's there's a lot of things that get affected by it but i think it's just fantastic and i i'm very grateful to be where i am so appreciate it so i get back back to you as an, as an author and stuff do you find being more of a face of the writing community has brought other pressures in terms of people and their expectations because no, no. okay fair <laughs> no. enough no to be honest with you it's, it's kind of a separate thing i mean i haven't had many well i have had readers of course from being on the writing community but it's more from the community than our show you know mm. that's just the, the, the way the community is and everyone's so supportive of each other it's crazy in a great way um but i don't think it's it's as a result of the show just now uh, i mean our website has got our author information on there so perhaps when if this say isn't a year down the line it's still going and we're still attracting good guests and, and our listeners have gone from hundreds to thousands then perhaps a lot more traffic will go through there and see click on our author pages and go to our links I don't know, but at the moment, I don't think so. You know, I'm not. You know, we're indie authors, and I, I'm not. I haven't got a big marketing game, and at the moment, I'm not selling a hell of a lot. So, you know, I'm just writing at the moment for the fun of it and just experience and loving the stories I'm writing. So, hopefully, it will just grow traction as it evolves. Yeah. Mm. Well, I think that's the thing. We as indie authors. Um, and, and traditional authors like a lot of traditional authors are also not full-time writing i mean yeah. uh, i'm in a writing group and have been for the past two years no three years mm. and it has helped my writing immensely like when i i, I actually found a, a, literally a ream of paper of stuff that i have had critiqued and given back to me by the writing group and it's when I looked at the oldest ones, I was cringing reading it, going, Oh, I can't believe I thought this was good. <laughs> but what I was building up towards was one of the other people in the writing group with me, she's a solicitor, but she also has three traditionally published books. Okay. And it, like writing is a much, much harder thing to have a full time career and to be like fully dedicated to because even with. A publisher behind her this woman has three books out there mm -hmm. and she still needs her day job to pay the bills yeah. it's, it's it's a myth i think a lot of us need to accept is a myth so that we don't feel like oh i'm not a proper writer yet because i'm not doing a full time you know that's that's rubbish and i think if you think that way yeah. then yeah i think the only way you're really going to make any sort of good money off your writing is if it gets option for tv and film and actually gets there and even mm -hmm. then it's not what you think so <laughs> Um, you know, hundreds of books get optioned by big authors and nothing happens. Do you know, so even if I know how excited I'd be if I got, let, you know, whatever happens, the process and said, oh, your book's being optioned for TV. I'd be like, whoa, whoa. Um, wow, yes, it's coming true. And then two years down the line, nothing's happened. You know, that's, that's the reality of what probably would happen. Uh, on the mm -hmm. off chance, it got uh, a job, you know, on, on production on Netflix or something. You know, we talked to Tim Lebon on the show, which is a great interview. He had his, The Silence, his book, made into a film. He didn't, he said, look, you know, if it was a Hollywood film, you know, like um, The Quiet Place and stuff, he, he probably would have made a shitload of money, but he didn't, you know, a contract with Netflix sort of thing. So even then, it's not, it's not what you, you know, it's not hitting the, the jackpot in, if you, if you will. Mm. Yeah. I thought it was really interesting. We've not dropped this yet, but with SJ Watson, um, before I go to sleep, he talked about that becoming a big film with Nicole Kidman and all that sort of stuff. And everyone's sort of dream his, that happened for him with his first book. Um, and like yourself, kind of, he was in a writing group and he said that that was the reason that he thought his book was as good as it was because he was in that writing group and because he got that feedback and he had that dream of the book selling really well. It's a number one bestseller it was in the New York times bestsellers list. It became a film. He obviously became, wealthy enough to quit his job from it as well um but that brought loads of other pressures for him because obviously 
he, uh, we spoke to him and it was quite embarrassing for me actually because I was mm. like, why have you spent so much time between book one and book two? And he was like, well, actually, there was a book in between that did nothing. Um, <laughs> oh, is it S.J. Watson interview? Yeah. This is dropping. Oh, exclusive. Um, it's, it's dropping tonight at 2 a.m. in the morning uh, for you American listeners. The Moonlight Sessions podcast will be at 2 a.m. this morning, followed by about 3 in the morning, the YouTube video. So nice. look out for that. Yeah, definitely. But yeah, he was, say, he was saying on that that obviously he got everything that you'd want as a first-time writer bringing out first novel. And it just brought so much pressure and like it really affected him in terms of like, I think it did affect him mentally from what we could kind of gather from the interview. Like he was worried about what people would think about the next one. And he kind of had to write a book and get it out of his system and it not to go so well before he got the confidence to do another one and get it out there and just write the book that he was happy with and stuff. So, you know, it's a, it's a really interesting and difficult game. I yeah. am tweeting right now. Exclusive S J Watson, not Warbson. <laughs> Watson, I can't spell this. Is so kind of whilst Agate's doing that, you've done your first book. Have you got any yep. others on, on the on the horizon? Um, well, actually, I have two published works. So I have um, I have the longest night, which I which was a year old a few days ago. Um, mm. And uh, I happy anniversary. Thank you. Um, uh, there you go. I was so absorbed in my current work that I actually didn't realize it until like eight o'clock that evening. I was like, oh, it's the year anniversary. Oh, I should be doing something. Um, so I have The Longest Night. Then I have an, a novella, which is actually permanently free to anybody watching or listening. Um, if you go to my website, um, connorbraden.com slash free book. And it's there, and it's called The Stolen Dagger. And it is kind of a prequel slash parallelquel, if that makes sense, <laughs> to, to the uh, to the first couple of chapters of The Longest Night. Um, oh, sorry to interrupt. Can you please say that word oh, again? Parallelquel. Parallelquel. I it's, love that. Yeah. yeah. It's a word I just made up on the spot. It's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, then I tried to write the sequel, to the longest night and i tried to pants it and mm. i uh, i am an extensive planner and i i i tried my best to pants the sequel um which will be called the darkest dawn uh, whenever it comes and i hated it i just couldn't handle it i i thought it was awful and i actually deleted the thirty thousand word manuscript because i just was so unhappy with it Mm. So I had this bit of a limbo for around seven months where I wrote nothing. And then I decided, I was talking to a friend, a friend of mine from work, another teacher who he gets a lift home with me every day. And I was talking to him about it and just kind of venting. And he said, you know, just try something completely different. So my current work is a children's um, fantasy book. And what I actually did was in school, I ran a mini competition between two classes that I was supporting <clears throat> and just got them, all the kids, to, they could pair up or not to design a book cover and nice. whatever book cover one i would write yes. so, oh nice cool i'm actually doing um so the my current work in progress is called the land of wonders mm. uh, it's yeah i'm really excited about it i really really like it and i'm i was writing it today i'm fifty nine thousand words in so far and quite happy nice. with it so, mm. so to get thirty thousand words into a book and then just sort of scrap it off in that sense like what what made you do that uh it was just <clears throat> see this this is one reason I, I was looking forward to talking to you i guess sorry i'm using the surname because that's it that's, how we deal with <laughs> that's all right Braden. <laughs> Braden. <laughs> Braden. No one, oh sorry sorry no one ever gets it right um because so the thing that made me delete it was like the first book was apart from a tiny bit that I threw in at the last minute before I hit publish. Um, the first book was, was a complete story. Ooh, mm. I forgot the phone. The first bit was a complete story. So then I had to take the same characters who had gone through a full character arc. One character, he, um, he had no friends and he was very closed off and now has a friend. One character was 
like they, they all went through a proper character arc. So then I had to invent new problems for them in order to justify having them in a sequel. Mm. Uh, I think that's the thing. I didn't, I think because I didn't plan the sequel and really think about it, I was trying to write it. I was doing NaNoWriMo. Um, so I was trying to get the 50,000 words done in 30 days. And I just, yeah, I just couldn't. I, I felt like the characters weren't themselves. Um, so yeah, I deleted it. I did email a copy of it to my, my partner, to uh, my boyfriend, um, just in case. <laughs> so it is out there in ether. But, uh, hmm. yeah. Do you know, it's, it's weird. We spoke to, I think, even Will Carver last week, week before. I've lost my days. Um, but he even said that at some point he literally just went, delete. And I can't... You, I can't yeah, you deleted a full book. I can't do it. I can't even delete, like I spoke about, I haven't even deleted a scene. I just mm. I can't see myself doing it. I'll look at it and go, oh, I so, might yeah. work on it. The reason I, I asked that, in terms of the deleting it, is like, I'm 70,000 words into a book now, and I'm thinking... Hmm. Is this the next thing that I want to bring out? Like, is this the yeah, real pop. thing? Mm. Well, it's it's exactly the book that I wanted is to write. This just <laughs> <laughs> um, is this just Huli calling a writer's block? No, I know how it ends and everything, but it, it's is this the next book that I want to bring out? Because, yeah. It's very different to my first one. It's crime. It's when I say it's a mix of Dexter and you, it, it really is. It's exactly that. But I'm like, do I want to bring that out for everyone to say, oh, this is just like you and just like Dexter? Like, uh, mix. yeah, because people like those things. So fuck it. Yeah, but do I want to be that person? Like, I yeah, think it's just speaking... not to be... Do you know what? There's nothing that's not original. Nothing's yeah. original anymore. It's all there. It's all there. There's loads of my books. Do you know how many times people have said now? Oh, it's like Hannah. I was like, what's Hannah? They're like, there's girl that lives in the woods. I'm like, what the fuck? I didn't know about this. Um, I know. I'm going to have to watch this now. Um, but like my space story, when I talked about that, I said to my friend, he's like, oh, that sounds like that film and that film put together. I was like, oh, for fuck's sake. Um, mm-hmm. But nothing's nothing's original anymore. And it's Have you ever heard of the, the concept of the seven plots? No. That there's only... It's it's a huge book. It took I can't even remember who wrote it. I'll um I'll find it. But basically, it's the idea that there are only seven stories. That that's it. There are only seven stories, and every other story is either a combination of two or three of them, or a variation on them. So it's things like um tra- a tragedy, a comedy. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, what's the other one? Um, rags to riches. Uh. You know, it's it's real basic things. I can't even remember the name of half of them, but it's mm. it's mad. Like if I had this, if I had the seven names of them, um, you can just look and be like, "Yep, that's that film." You just name a film, and you can make it slot into any of those seven. So mm. don't worry. I think, it, I think it's mainly because of the impact of the writers that we've had on the show. Like we had Steve Kavanagh come on, and he said, "I wrote that book intentionally. It had twists. It had plot twists. Like that's how I wanted it to be." Um, and then this, we've had other people go, like like Will Carver, for example. I wrote a whole book, and I got rid of it because it's not what I wanted to bring out. And that's kind of the process that I was in. At that like I'm reading it and thinking, yeah, it's, it's it's good. It's like this. It's like that. But is it what I want to bring out? Like, yeah, it's difficult. Yeah, do you know, so what, I do you know what? You, you just got to go for it and try. And if you if you don't try, you'll never know. <laughs> and it's always going to be similar to someone else's story at some point, but you've got to make already done sort of topics your own. And that's what makes a story different. Mm. But you've talked about this, Christian, Chris. Because like they opened a new tab. Um, Mr. Connor's gone. He's frozen again. Oh, no, he's Flash back. drinking. Nice. Back. <laughs> <laughs> well, I actually about... found that. Mm. I found the seven plots thing, if you want to hear it. Oh, yeah, go on. Okay, so the idea is you could name any book, TV show, story, and it will fit into one of these seven. So there's Overcoming the Monster, Rags to Riches, The Quest, Voyage and Return, Comedy, Tragedy, which I named, and Rebirth. Okay. 
Christopher Booker, by the way, if anyone wants to read it. It's it's huge. It's more like a textbook, but it's huge. Mm, that's a great name for anyone writing a book. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Anya. Um, it is a happy book release day, and I don't know if you listened to this from the start or you're just joining to the stream now. Um, I'm very excited today because the first time the book came out, my first book, I was so worked up about how things were, the procedures, and not knowing what the fuck I was doing. Uh, I didn't really enjoy it, and I pointed mm. out the fact I need to enjoy all the parts of this release, and I am. So, can I'm we can myself. we see where it is on the book chart? I get. Do you know where it's where it's coming? You know, what? It, it hasn't had a lot of sales, so uh, probably not very far. Uh, right. um, it had 19 pre-orders. That's not bad. That's pretty good. Uh, if, I reckon if I got 19 sales on one day, I'd shoot somewhere in, yeah, in the Yeah, don't get me wrong. It was like 300 something. Um, but still, it's, you know, it's, it's hard, isn't it? Uh, mm. We are currently, oh, 81st in horror uh, short stories. Nice. Um, that's Yeah, that's not bad at all, actually. Um, 81st in horror short stories. That's how, uh, you know, it'd be nice to get to a pretty a pretty even number one straight away, wouldn't it? But who knows, who knows? Let's check the US charts, you never know. Um, no. <laughs> US charts, uh, 13,000 in short stories. Jeez, that's a lot isn't, of books. Isn't it just, yeah. Let's not look at that. Um, let's check my paperback. Is that the same chart? I don't know. So we'll keep looking at the charts and we'll say thank you very much, Connor. Uh, for coming on the show and being a co-host with us today. It's been absolutely fantastic having you with us. Um, and we're very much looking forward to, one, being on your show and sending all our guests to you to be on your show as well. Well, well, Huli, we say about, be, can't wait to be on it. I've been on the show. Uh, and as Colin mentioned earlier, I, I'm guest guest one, which is amazing. Uh, Has when that is dropped yet? Oh. No. That's what I meant. <laughs> So when tell people, tell people, Connor, when when can they see show one? Uh, I don't know if you guys can hear me because my internet is really choppy and I can barely hear you guys, but I think I know what you asked. Um my see, so see what one. I'm hearing is all I heard was <laughs> um, when, when, when is show one <laughs> <laughs> episodes one which is yourself, uh, Mr. Agat. Episode two, which is um, another author friend of mine, uh, Nemanja Pavlovich, who's a Bosnian fantasy writer. And episode three, which is the previous guest of yours, Mario Delolio. They are all dropping on the same day. Um, wow. They're all coming out on September 7th. Um, so it's all going to be there from half nine uh, Irish time. And uh, yeah, they'll all be there. And then they're going to, and then they're going to go uh, once a week, after that, um, okay. on Mondays. On a Monday, nice, <laughs> excellent. Yeah, so kind of, we'll, we'll say thank you very much for being on the show, and we can't wait to hear your shows. And we will retweet them, and we'll promote them on the show. Oh yeah, uh, and hopefully we can have you as author you on the show at some point in the future as well. Uh, we will, we will. There's no if. Yes. Connor, we'll get you on. And the hopefully, show, my internet will be a lot better whenever that happens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's one of those things. I mean, um, a CD major the other day, we spent about 20, 25, 30 minutes getting her into that mm. sword. So it's one of those things that comes with the show. So don't worry about yeah. it. And it wasn't that bad. We've had plenty worse. Um, uh, but thank <laughs> you again, uh, to everyone that's listened to the show and watched the show. I know it's a long one again, but hopefully you've enjoyed and you've, you've enjoyed it. You know, there's been some good, good, interesting conversations throughout and, <laughs> Like we said, please check out uh, Carden Le Leia's book, um, Becoming Insane. It look, does look very good. And the cover, you can't really see it too clearly. It, it looks very nice and gothic-y. Um, you know what I mean? Up there, Huli, that way. Um, it's weird when I think I look at Huli. Like it's hard because you don't. It's the opposite way. There, am I looking at it? I think I am. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Um, so yeah, thank you all for listening to the show, and um, thank you guys for interviewing me. Connor, it's been a pleasure, honestly. Uh, for the second time you've interviewed me, I know, um, no, <laughs> extended part of the show, cool, all good, yep. yeah. Congrats once again, 
Chris. Oh, thank you so much. And I hope people buy it and I hope people read it. And if you haven't read the first, they, they're both 99p at the moment. Steals. I'm going to buy it right now once my phone, you know. <sighs> thank you. It's an actually a bargain. Buy them, even if you don't read them. I'll be happy if you buy them. But uh, also, SJ Watson show, 2 a.m. tonight in the UK time, meaning American time, whatever. Uh, Anya, if you're still watching, any of you Americans uh, that are still watching, when the show comes out and drops tonight, I'll be asleep. So if you can feel the need to retweet for us, uh, it'd be fantastic. So thank you so much. And I hope you um, I hope you really enjoy the show and retweet for us. Thanks, Anya. Bye, Anya. Bye. Good night. <laughs> <laughs> Bad man says good night. <laughs>